do think today part of what it means to have an experience uh, is is for it to be social in some way and it can be the documentation uh, and the sharing of it is a big part of that and I think the, the best way to understand that is uh, traditionally in, with photography uh, the the photo object right the mm -hmm. art object that was sort of the ends and the content the scene and all that's the means towards the ends and I think of digital uh, uh, the so social photography it's kind of switched uh, where the ends is the social experience, what you're communicating, and the means is the photo object. And it's so merely the means that on Snapchat, you're actually just willing to let that fade away. Right? Mm -hmm. the, whole, the ends of traditional photography, you're willing to let fade away. Uh, and not just Snapchat, I mean, that's, I mean, realistically, if you post a photo to Instagram, no one's looking at it yeah. a week from now, right? It might as well be. If it's ephemeral sort of de facto in many ways. Of course, somebody can find it. You know, it's not like perfectly ephemeral. But yeah. you know, very broadly speaking, I think that the document, the art object, the historical remembering part of it is just merely the means that we're more and more letting that fade away, which speaks to how the stuff is kind of in the moment rather than being a, a documented mm -hmm. removed from it. Mm -hmm. Speaking of documenting while we're doing something, I'm going to use this Google Doc to document what we're doing. <laughs> so I, I, it's going to be a very subjective sort of experience for everyone. So I hope that's not distracting. If you say something that doesn't, you don't want on the record, just give me like a. <laughs> <laughs> just to follow up on what uh, Nathan and we just talked about in terms of just the uh, the actual digital experience being the means in itself, so just that is sort of the, the end of what we're looking for with that. And, and so um, is that then sort of a, another percepting, feeling part of us? And, 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 and is that something that's just changing our lived experience fundamentally compared to some of these older technologies like photography or uh, uh, you know, writing? And you're, if you are experiencing the moment as a moment, then you're already removed, right? You're not totally in the moment. The, the dog chasing a ball is in the moment. Right. The dog isn't thinking of the, himself or herself, whatever, uh, as a dog chasing a ball. Uh, but we have knowledge, we have thought, we think of the moment as a moment, we think of ourselves as a self. And in that sense, we're already removed, right? Like, it's the philosopher, not the selfie taker, who's most removed from the moment, right? Because you're already conceiving the moment as a moment. You're already doing that removed. Uh, and so I think we, we do a lot of hand wringing around the you know person taking the selfie, going, ah, they're not in the moment. And it's like, well, you know, to be purely in the moment would be to not have language or concepts or anything like that. But there, I think that there is some truth, and you know, I also will ask our psychologists in the panel as well, but, but just, you know, in terms of just the, um, uh, effect on, on attention and, and perception in the moment. So, so, you know, we do direct our attention to the thing that we're capturing through media. So even in, you know, in photographs, we just point the camera and capture a particular moment of the day and then have that image with respect. We would look over and over at that image and like sort of overshadow other things that, that happened that day. So it kind of makes sense that it's a choice made during the event which then impacts how we remember it later the weight might be increasing. So, so in the, the digital media, you know, if we're, um, you know, are we doing that even more so? Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I guess I can take it from here. First of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, here. <laughs> and uh, uh, the introduction that Sonia uh, read and delivered was, I think, uh, aptly summarized, summarized what I do. Um, so uh, when I was invited to, to uh, to be here today, I sort of thought about the whole idea of autobiographical memory, memory, um, and digital media from the perspective that I um, that I take. And I, uh, I mean, here I represent a psychologist, but mm -hmm. I, I think some other psychologists would disagree <laughs> from within the field. But uh, so the first thing that jumped out to, to me is that I mean, I think that uh, this is a larger point that I guess I want to make is that memory was always mediated. I think what, what we have now is the change in sort of mode and modality because, I mean, for especially from the, the perspective of type of psychology that I do, we always talk about language mediating the, the memory, whether it's uh, written language or narrated language or just the social narratives that surround us, right? Um, but in terms of answering the question that, that uh, Sonia, you posed, uh, in terms of um, attention and the relationship of memory to attention, um, you know, like 
if we think about it from a psychological perspective or like what people most associate as purely psychological perspective coming from Freud for example he always thought about attention being a dividing point between consciousness and pre-consciousness so our consciousness is where our attention is at the moment so from that perspective I think that there is something to digital media which sort of intensifies this this level of consciousness and brings about you know another layer of awareness that that um, also leaves a trace that then we can sort of look over and, and trace the almost the workings of our consciousness in that particular particular moment. So yeah. Mm. Can I jump in? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so sort of bringing these two things together, the thing that I think might be different, at least for me, is that all digital media is socially mediated. So it's not autobiographical memory, it's a network autobiography. Right. And on Snapchat, something disappears immediately, but if you look at Twitter or a comment section on popular sites, um, that's a place where you know that, okay, I'm, live, I'm doing this in real time, but eventually it's going to be proof of something for someone. Um, the example that I really like thinking about this with is um, when Osama bin Laden was assassinated and the guy was live tweeting something happening. Come to find out he was live tweeting that moment happening. So there was this mm -hmm. record that became really important when it became the proof of something that could be verified. And like a lower stakes version of that would be in a comment section um, on a site like Know Your Me. Somebody writes first just to prove that I was here before everybody else and was able to leave a comment. And it becomes part of this autobiographical narrative that's a network autobiography where we're all sharing this digital space together and everything's sort of mixing up. But these are the points where I enter. And even on a site like Instagram, you said it, it's sort of ephemeral, but there will be that person that searches for the tag and suddenly it comes up and it bubbles up and it becomes a proof of whatever, whatever that person is looking for. Um, so I think one of the new mediating things that is there that's different from the past is it's, it's very social. Mm -hmm. Like if we could all read books together in the past, but we couldn't be in the head of other people reading, but because we do the live updates, we, we do all of these things together in a very different way now. You're saying also that we're like aware of that, because I think it's easy, easy to sort of say, oh, like we don't even know that we're, but like, we know. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. we look for it. We want the likes, we yeah. want the favorites, we want the thumbs up, we want to be followed and have friends and do all the stuff on the site so that we know somebody's going to see this thing. Right. So, I'm um, thinking about that, so like, because we have this awareness and we want to have like this persona out there, you know, like we are creating these traces that, as you said, we can go back to them, but how honest or how real or maybe they are because our, it, it's just a, a, an expression of like our need to be light and that is part of who we are but I think that then it starts creating this duality you know and how our lives are separated or not of our documentation of, of it and how we present how we present it out there. I, I think it would depend on how I'm going to put the prosthetics and say mm -hmm. amputated. It depends on how amputated you feel you are from your digital self. Mm -hmm. Like if you feel like going through the digital, updating the space is something that I do on a regular basis and it's just part of my life. There's no duality. Um, I'm in multiple groups online with people that I see regularly face to face and our interactions are the same in those two spaces so I would never say there's a duality in the jade that I am there versus the jade that I am when I'm sitting at a table with them. And I think most of us have those experiences. Um, at other times we have professional sites like LinkedIn where yes this is my professional persona, this is who I am, but we also have that professional persona when we go into our workspaces. Mm -hmm. So it's a duality that exists even offline. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of times we want to make them different but again as Luca said we've always been mediated. Like we are speaking to each other. I know for many of us, um, not me, but English isn't the first language of everybody sitting in the circle, but we're able to communicate. And that's an act of mediation that we can see and we can point to and we can break if somebody decides to stop speaking English. And there's a duality there that you're living with every day, but it doesn't feel odd because it's a normal thing to do. If, if I can just add a, another comment, I, and I think this discussion about curating our presentations in the virtual world is a very apt discussion to have at this point. But I think, you know, if we take something like clothing, for example, like we've always curated our expression. And every morning when we get up, it's like you're confronted with, even in your limited wardrobe, like 10,000 choices that you can make of, of the combinations of different clothes that you will put on, right? And you 
do choose it, then you go into the world presenting something to the world, using the clothes as a social mediating. Again, it's like the thing that happens with social media, I think that's very important to recognize, is that it amplifies this beyond proportions because what what happened in the past is that you would curate yourself through fashion, for example, to people who could see you viscerally or could see you in their everyday context. Whereas today, people can see you in Australia, in New Zealand, in Europe, and it's the time and space are sort of irrelevant with where you curate yourself. Oh, just, I mean, it's, it's amazing how much bad tech writing there is that sort of thinks that performance is like it was invented. Like, it's like as old as Mark Zuckerberg or something. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> and he's not that old. Right? Exactly, yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, there's, we've been, that's the whole history of identity theory is, is uh, you have as many selves as you have people that reflect uh, back to you. And uh, I think what we need to talk about is social context. Like, I kind of get worried about the word duality as if there's an online and offline you or something like that. You have as many selves as you have social contexts. Uh, I'm okay with people saying that they only have one self or they have a million selves in all their different contexts, but certainly not two. Uh, and your, your, <laughs> <laughs> my performance from Twitter to Facebook might be closer than from here to if I'm at my mom's house. But like, and it's what we should be talking about is various contexts uh, and how you perform in these different contexts. You know, when we talk about sites, you know, social media, we shouldn't be like, oh, this site. Uh, you, people are being fake or people are being real. I hate both of that. Uh, we should just talk about what kind of performance do these various sites or contexts afford. Uh, so when we talk about, uh, Jay was talking about the likes and all of that, you know, that we put metrics and likes and everything, we foregrounded that across most of our social media. Well, that kind of, by gamifying identity that deeply, well, that affords a certain type of, uh, of uh, identity. I think that's the conversation I'd rather have rather than somebody trying to chase down what's real or authentic, which you'll never, never catch. <laughs> yeah, so maybe, you know, I mean, it, you know, we definitely, you know, wanted to generate sort of like a lively conversation and show that we have some disagreement, but it seems like we generally here seem to agree that, that, <laughs> that, that there's, uh, you know, that, that there really isn't the sort of, you know, uh, duality, uh, you know, and, and, the, and then the two worlds in which we it's the, the different contexts in which we live. But um, but some of the things that uh, you know, I mean, the, the immediacy and the time space collapse, and also the remembering for forgetting collapse. Some of these things that are different than before, it is doing something. And so, what is it doing to us, or what is it doing to the way that we? Communicate, or the way that we have, the way that we understand each other, and you know, one of the things that that, that just you know uh, seemed to emerge from the conversation with Luca and, and, and Jay was just that, uh, for example, that you know maybe there's a there's a, there's a there's an aspect of the of the of the social media uh, interaction that is that a lot of actually you know, Nathan was also talking about, but the, the, the meta aspect, so we're immediately like are able to we're aware of being watched, and we're, we're aware of these. You know, question mark how many uh, is like right now for us? Is it three or is it? Like, <laughs> people have been talking about someone But, but anyway, but, but, there's, but there's an uh, there's an ongoing sort of uh, meta something or other that is that is new compared to uh, you know before having these technologies and and uh, you know do we and, and also um, the way that we have these flexible selves online and you know and, and, and so is there you know, what is this new psychology, I mean, it, it, of, of just our, our being, you know, we used to have this um, sort of neuroessentialism notion that you know, we are what's, what our brain function is, but now is it the brain plus, you know, internet? Um. I think certain, because no one else is talking. <laughs> I, I think because of digital tools, certain habits that I have have expanded more. Like with my phone, I may look at like the clouds and I'll take a photo <laughs> and then I take like 50 photos of the same thing and I'm just spamming it. Or like on my Facebook, and it, it's funny though, to me it's funny and it's amusing and I don't really share it with anybody, like I don't like put it online or anything, but I do it and I keep it in my computer and I do nothing with it. And then on Facebook, it's the same thing where like now, I'm messing with my own timeline where I'm going back to like 1993 and posting something that didn't happen mm -hmm. then, like a YouTube video or something, and it's like, I don't fully understand it myself or like why I'm doing it, but there's kind of certain 
I think there are certain mysteries within those worlds that we can expand upon and play with, um, and that's all. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so your impulse is kind of like hack the system of of, yeah. of that like regurgitating your memory back at you. Yeah, I know I'm not going to get. don't know why that's your impulse. Yeah, I I know I'm not going to get more than five likes on a post that I make just because nobody wants to like what I post. So <laughs> then I just start doing. It sounds sad, but it's kind of just like I don't. I don't. I'm not. I perceive that some people are very into that kind of world, and it's a little bit faster paced than I am, so I, I don't feel a need to cultivate like a style on there. Though you can't say it's a style anymore, because anything is, but I start doing weird, weird things on these sites as an impulse just because I want to see if anybody is going to actually have a conversation with me about like, hey, where are you, what, why am I looking at this? Like, it doesn't really happen though, so I don't, I don't know what's going on. Um, but yeah, it's kind of an impulse and, and messing with these systems, which I think a lot of artists do. I mean, Saturday you have a piece where it's like um, the looper piece that you have, where it's like bookmarks. So when I'm in a browser, like I have like Gmail, Facebook, and Twitter, and I kind of cycle through those, and I don't realize I'm cycling through them. And so you made an app where it's like it tells me when I'm like doing that, and it's like stop, you're stuck in this loop, like. Which is like I turned it off because it was so, it was like coming up all the time. Yeah, <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> Let me go between the apps I want to go between. Yeah. But it's weird because I don't understand that nostalgia, like or not. It's not even nostalgia. It's like a lot of time it's like looking at what other people posted and then checking it's what I also posted. It's, it's, yeah, it's a habit. Yeah. But I don't know if I have those habits necessarily in the real world. Like, I feel like the... Mm. Well, I mean, these are designed to create that habit, yeah. and that goes back to the slot machines. Like, Natasha Del Show is like, great <laughs> yeah. by design, and she talks about this as the machine zone. We need uh -huh. to find yourself cycling, and it's the exact same thing that casino <laughs> people want you to the machine zone, where basically get rid of your agency and do our bidding, like, you know. You, but, yeah, sorry. No. <laughs> so I think that's an important point because it brings us to this, you know, fact that these platforms that we're using are not neutral, mm -hmm. right? And and so, you know, and basically there are both personal and social implications of that. That that you know, all this information we put out there, but then there are baits to make us like <laughs> do these things, and also the data that becomes mineable and mm -hmm. usable by others, and others mm -hmm. can be anybody from, you know. A researcher doing the kind of, or an artist doing the work that Jig's doing, or Lori's doing, um, or some corporation that's doing something horrible. <laughs> so then the question is like, how does the corporate yeah, it's, it's aspect play into it? I but I think that's really. that's actually one of the biggest questions because like for 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 us in psychology at least, I mean I think Sonia, you're coming from a neurologist perspective, so it's. A little, a little bit different, but we always talked about the relationship of the self and space, right? But what makes the at least the digital world at this point different is that if you go out on the street, right, you're entering entering public space. You want to turn left on thir on 25th Street, you can. You want to turn right, you can. You want to go into the restaurant, you can. It's completely up to you. But I think there is lack of such public spaces on the internet because mm -hmm. every space right now that at least I can think of that I use to mediate my memory or my autobiographical memory or whatever other function that I might be using um, and I see the benefits of it for myself so whether it's Facebook, Google and such these are private domains I mean this is we think of Google almost as if going out on the street mm -hmm. like you want to go on, on, on the internet at least for me I mean for somebody else it might be Yahoo search engine but it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's Google right so but this is a private platform Mm -hmm. And I think this is where, in the future, because I mean, you can see now throughout the world we have sort of contested spaces. So what's private, what's public, what park is uh, is private, what park is public, whether it's in New York, Istanbul, uh, Barcelona, whatnot. I think the future of sort of contestation on, on the internet will be this public sphere and some sort of need to develop a public sphere. Because if you look at over the immediate history, for example, with Google and their their idea to digitize all the books, 
that they had a great idea a few years ago, but all of a sudden they ran out of funding and they stopped that idea, mm -hmm. which was supposed to be an idea in a public service, but then all of a sudden, well, you know, like, well, we ran out of, and I know I sound like an old school Marxist here, but, but I think this, this, you know, this needs to be explored further about where, where, where does our self begin and stop digitally, and where does, what the overlap of public-private sphere in, in, in the, yeah. Um, yeah, it's an interesting point to think about if internet was ever public. It was, it was actually never public. It had a promise of becoming mm -hmm. public at a very utopic stage, but it's a military infrastructure to start with, as, as we all know, and as it became privatized, it's becoming um, it, this appearance of, appearance of having a private space in the internet through the login, mm -hmm. your own identity, but as a matter of fact, this is a vehicle mm -hmm. to design services and to provide um, the, to provide a space for our habits at the cost of our, our convenience. So, um, just going back to our earlier discussion about like, are these images such as Snapchat and Instagram are made for the permanent memory, or is this more of a spontaneous um, ephemera? There's a there's a concept of undead information, the information that is not dead or living, and I think that's a really interesting mm -hmm. metaphor to think of um, information that is never alive, but it will not die either, mm -hmm. like Dracula or Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. right? And um, I like to think of it that way because I think the services are designed to make us undead or unliving, and the best example is uh, how sleep changed according after introduction of technology, how our notion of sleep and attention span, um, when you're conscious and when you're not conscious has changed. And Jonathan Crary talks about how, mm -hmm. you know, this whole notion of 24-7, uh, how, every, how, how everything is on, how Citibank says it's, it will never sleep, and how internet is never at the same time. So my, my position in this is, is that uh, I think the notion of um, neoliberal self as this constantly broadcasting um, ourselves and you know, reinventing our public identity is is real. It, it is. It does exist. Um, the bigger question is to how do we challenge the superstructure that we're talking about? So if you look at uh, Walter Benjamin's work in the age of mechanical reproduction, there's the notion of the structure that. Uh, that controls the structure. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm less interested about Facebook or Google, but the infrastructure in general that make this possible. Mm -hmm. um. And then there's, I, mean, I think that just you know, general public has very little knowledge. Is very much. Very little. I mean, so, so, I mean, including myself. I mean, just, just I mean, people just generally have very little understanding of these mechanisms behind the mm -hmm. platforms that we use, and what are these algorithms, and what. You know, it's it's um you know, and part of it is you know you always of course um, kind of check yourself in terms of like you know not having excessive amount of paranoia and and, and but at the same time um, I think that it's worthwhile to consider what are the interests behind uh, you know these platforms that we so freely contribute to mm -hmm. our most personal thoughts and ideas and. and you know, and even Google Docs, you know, for example, the entire collaboration that Sarah and I have is in our Google Docs, you know, like documents and documents and, you know, and that's, you know, I mean, initially that was a conversation of like, you know, Sonia comes from scientific background world and I'm like, no, like we want to make our work public, like that's yeah. the point of making artwork. I mean, that's like another conversation. But anyway, the point is just that, you know, it's, it's, it's in Google Docs and that's, you know, uh, that's what it is, and is that, you know. Well, I, I think it is possible to create alternative channels, and there are artists and activists who invest their energy to create mm -hmm. um, un, untethered mm -hmm. in terms of the policy and uh, ownership of the data. Um, mm -hmm. That's definitely something that we all should think about. But um, that's a very small niche, and that's a very um, alternative, you know, mm -hmm. effort. So the question that we could have is like, what what are the conditions that exist for us today, and mm -hmm. what what is the significance? And I I did a project with some students of actually reading the terms of agreement of Google or Facebook. Mm -hmm. and it really scares them. Yeah. 
It basically means that we have no control of our data after we disappear. And, and I think what's really important is that, you know, we, I mean, you know, if we all agree that we are still human beings like always, but the context in which we navigate and live are changing from the digital media as this whole other thing to our existence, you know, to even have proper, you know, operation of politics and our engagement and mm -hmm. political process, we need to understand where are we living half of our life and what is this space and what are the implications of you know, who is in control of the information and all of that stuff that's related to that. So I'd be very interested to hear, you know, a little bit, you know, more from, from you, Tina, or from anybody else just about um, just, you know, some of those mechanisms behind these engines because there's, that's sort of like this dark kind of thing that nobody really knows right. much about. So um, this neuroscientist slash philosopher named Catherine Malabou in France has the book um, called uh, What Do We Do With Our Brain? <laughs> so what do we do with this thing? Uh, and it talks about the notion of a plasticity, uh, synaptic plasticity, plasticity as a metaphor to think about um, alternative to flexibility that is enforced on us through, um, through techno technocratic societies. So we are usually asked to be really flexible in this world, to be everything, to be everywhere at the same time, and to be available. But it's really daunting to be a flexible person. Um, and by becoming flexible, it takes away our agency to actually give change to the world. So by plastic, uh, plasticity, I mean to receive and give form, right? To help have this malleable energy to create changes. And she takes the synaptic plasticity to the more social plasticity of actually giving agency to each other's voices and um, kind of protests and uh, having a speech and making these um, statements as a way of changing our relationship with the larger superstructure that we're talking about. So I think that's really liberating to think that we don't always need to be flexible and we can choose to opt out. And one of the assignments that I'm working on with my students this term is a week without Google. So you need wow. to be not use Google product at all uh, for a week. And this is a really interesting, a yeah, really interesting <laughs> task for two reasons. It, you, you re, you're reminded how dependent you are, and you also know like how the alternatives actually exist to access every one of us through some media uh, mediations that are less um, um, less less dominating. Yes. So um, you know, it's it's coming back to this notion of. Um, Switching from the society of control, um, society of discipline to society of control, mm -hmm. and Deleuze talks about how you know this whole Foucault's idea of like panopticon doesn't actually make sense anymore because we are surveilling ourselves mm -hmm. as much as the police or the state. So I mm -hmm. think the flex, the, that's the flexible self, how mm -hmm. we volunteer to progress. So uh, just uh, showing that the yeah, options are possible is a way mm -hmm. for artists. No. Just thinking of your assignment, you know that uh, Google has taken over uh, most email services for all the major universities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even in that, they offer this package that's really low cost. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what if we all get an app that we're that all the universities are, are on? That? I don't know if you are, but we are. Right. Um, oh, yeah. Usually, those get special contracts, though. Yes, so what is that contract yeah. is not a normal Google yeah. Terms of Service, it's one that's yeah, that's right. yeah. by the council of the... Yeah, yeah, no, that's what they told us. Yeah. That's what they told us. We don't get ads, that's the... You know. <laughs> and then yeah. the, the council may have their own interests too, though. Yeah, that's right, because the university has access to everything. As like yeah. a student, you're still not really protected by the university, probably. But you weren't as to use university email. Yeah. Yeah. Like regardless of where it's from, mm -hmm. especially if you're at a public school, then everybody has access to it. Mm -hmm. I just want to like, make a sort of couple of this, like historical points and like, kind of bring some of the digital conversations into some into some history. I feel like there is a there are some assumptions here. Uh, like, well, we we're talking about the physical world as a place where you can you know kind of do what you want. I mean, that's a very mm -hmm. particular perspective to understand out there as the site of agency and freedom. A lot of people understand that as not a site of agency and 
and freedom for some people, uh, the internet affords all sorts of new new possibilities and able to say new things that weren't able to be said. And we talk about ability and disability, we can talk about lots of different things. Um, and also um, kind of the, the idea of, of, of being more flexible or more liquid, maybe in Sigmund Bauman's term, or uh, a lot of stuff on speed. There's a wonderful book I love, it's called The uh, Age of Immediacy. It's kind of a, a cultural history of speed and sort of talks about I mean, basically all of these conversations are ones that we've been doing since the dawn of the Enlightenment. Like really, like we're just dealing with the Enlightenment here still. Uh, we've, the world was always too, the world from before you were born was too slow, the world that you were in right now is too fast, and the world where you were born in was perfect. That's been the reality for people for a very, very long time. Our, our hand wringing over the speed and flexibilization all that doesn't even compare to what people were dealing with when the real world came around. Right? Or like the novel. Oh my god, people were so upset about the idea of a woman reading a novel, therefore her head is not inside the house. And like, <laughs> the, and like which fundamentally shook like marriage and reproduction. I mean, these are, you know, especially in a more religious society, like, like our, our discussions here would seem almost trivial compared to how uh, these exact same conversations have popped up. Um, which really just kind of is this is you know we're just I think we're just dealing with this post post enlightenment stuff and uh, uh, which doesn't doesn't is no way disqualifies it as a good conversation like all these conversations are really good how is uh, uh, you know having a camera phone in your pocket different than what people were experiencing when they first had a camera a brownie camera stuff like that how those things are different I just what I would want to avoid is sort of a false novelty yeah. that we're sort of like that this like liquid or detached mm -hmm. self is like is like a new thing. I mean, you, we can uh, uh, one of the things I show when I when I was teaching a lot is this uh, Future Shock movie that Orson Welles did on that Alvin Toffler book in the '70s, mm -hmm. and it's amazing because it's Orson Welles is doing this uh, uh, you know whole narration which just sounds like he's talking about social media and, uh, and it's, mm -hmm. it sounds so contemporary. But then they were worried about you know how many choices there were at a supermarket. That was the thing that was like, this is just, our society is done. Like, we had too many choices at the supermarket, stuff that we now just would kind of take for granted. And this last thing I want to say is, uh, I think the, my favorite conversation here is sort of uh, dealing with, you know, who, who, like, really can we try to get behind who's controlling these platforms? I think so much of the best conversations around the internet need to be, how do we come to terms with the fact, and we're talking about this earlier, how do we come to terms with the fact that we gave so much power to so few people without any regulation, uh, I don't think like we like we're complaining about it. We understand that we feel that, but I don't think we've comprehended what that power is, how to get it back, if we want to get it back, who gets like all of that. I don't think has really even been scratched because we're still just going, holy, holy shit, that happened. Uh, so I think that's what I would just love to see so much more and, of. And, like we we recently had a show here at the space that was uh, um, it was all about that privacy paradox. Like all the other work lived in routers that we had here, they weren't connected to the internet, so you had to come to a space to connect to a network mm -hmm. and see them in your device. It was many layers. And all the work curated was about the sense of privacy, uh, loss maybe online, but also this idea that we know we know it, but we are not actively like doing anything about it. Uh, or you or, can't. Maybe you're giving away, you're not using Google products, yeah. so it's kind of a sign of privilege, right? That you don't have a job that's forcing you to use Google products, right? Like, yeah. that you can take that week off of work, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's that conversation that. about, you know, like, we know about this, but do we act on it? Do we, do we want to, or do, or do we don't even want to? Which is also a fair question, you know, yeah. like what you were saying. Because, um, I, I, I mean, while I empathize with the project, yeah, you can sort of experiment of being seven days off of Google, I just don't think that we can, yeah. most of us can, like if we said, okay, from this point on, I'm just not going to use the internet. <laughs> well, no, not you yet. could. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think, sorry. Yeah. I don't think you can. I mean, I don't think you can and have a job or... Oh man, this is something like, <laughs> can we, it's so hard to imagine yeah, it's so hard to world yeah. Outside of capitalism, it's easier to think of the world like that doesn't exist. Like it's this is this is not a criticism to any of you, right? In yeah. respect to the, the complexities of life that we have, but it's I think it's totally possible, and we should imagine that if if we sure. want to if we want to live in a world that we have some sort of agency. And this is the first point that you made just recently about 
is the artistry safe to go out? Like, do, do I have an agency? Do, if, if I'm not the ethnic norm, if I'm not gender norm, if I'm not physical norm, no, that's a, no, the street is not, it's, it's not, so, and so is the internet, like Google is not neutral for all of us, um, it might turn its back on us, we might do something that we can't undo, um, and we've seen that in online harassments, um, Gamergate is a good example, um, kind of the um, sexism that prevails the internet spaces, mm -hmm. and how it, even though it's a violent space, it is an alternative to a physical space that some people of different diversity or identity might have. So I, I think we have a duty to to reimagine, and I, I, I share this vision with people who work at Google, and they think of it the same way. Cause the, although I, I appreciate the historical contextualization of how this has been going on for a long time, but not at this scale and not at this intricate level of control in daily life. And not in any history of or human history, a single corporation or identity of a corporation has been so um, creating this monoculture that we are so used to. So I have less problem with like um, spreadsheets or like you know idea of a collaborative note taking. Mm -hmm. I'm more about um, I, the brand that we are so used to. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I Okay. So I always go back to language with that stuff, so it's no, but yes, English is spoken all over the place, and we mediate so much of our experience through language, we mediate memory through language, we mediate pain through language, and it centers who we are as a person, and the reason that it exists is because the British Empire was all over the world. And so we have these examples from colonialism, it's the same with French. There are more French speakers outside of France than there are in France that did this before. It was just sort of different. And what we're talking about and what's scary about the internet is it's taking that like complete loss of control capitalism that's always existed in colonial places and sort of making it normal without anybody questioning it. Mm -hmm. But for many people, this, this just isn't new, and we have good traces of that in language. I mean, English is a hybrid language because the British Isles were colonized by the Germans and the French. So this is something that we carry with us. We just sort of separate this as something new, but we know what it looks like, and we sort of know how it ends, which is it doesn't quite ever, mm -hmm. or at least it seems like it doesn't quite ever completely go away, but it, it can shift. We can like shift the power. Um, I, in, in that sense, I think that something that is interesting is, you know, also like all these uh, ideas that come up with digital media, with the internet, and saying like, oh, now, you know, everything is democratized, you know, like, memory is now in the base and out of the institutions mm -hmm. and things like that, but uh, who is really, you know, controlling that content at the end of the day or understanding how that is delivered to you, like even with Facebook, your memory three or years ago. Or even with the search engine, the web comes up first, um, right. and, 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 by somebody. Right. And then in that sense, I'm also very curious with both of your projects in archiving, uh, that you're also doing them online, you know, and how do you, uh, how is your experience, you know, of like kind of stepping out of, of that a more institutionalized way of, of sharing the content and thinking about memories and what you are producing as a vessel for these uh, for these memory traces. Mm -hmm. You know, I, the Collected Visions project that I started in '96, which was just a year after you could put photographs on the web, um, at the time people. Some people got really angry with me at the thought of putting their family photographs online and letting other people see them, which I wish I had recorded those conversations <laughs> because, I, I, like, I can't. I just remember like the anger that some people and some people absolutely refused, you know, to give me, you know, images for that reason. And I and it ended up that the site, which I, without knowing it, I made it during the 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 end of the analog photograph. And part of why I don't update the site too much anymore is that it's that history that's there. And also in looking at it, I've also come to realize, looking at it now, and I also made an installation, a, a moving image installation with it, that, that with analog, anything, it had like this tactile historical um, part of it. So you could see a photograph 
that was bent, if you wanted to get rid of somebody that you didn't like in your past, you had to cut them out or scratch them out, and now you can just like seamlessly Airbrush. make anybody disappear. And now it's gotten easier, like in a second, you know, you can like get rid of all traces. So, um, uh, so I think it's really fascinating that that's happened like so fast. You know, really when you think like 1996 um, to now, it's what 20 years, 20 years, yeah, 20 years, which is really, you know, uh, really nothing. And also the our photography changed. Like it used to be about the past, and now it's about the present. So you take photos with your phone to enhance the present. You're not thinking about the future. You're thinking about, about, you know, it's like you take the picture, you look at it with somebody. So it's about that present moment. And it's also about kind of like curating your future because you delete the ones where you look bad. You make yourself look happy, hoping, which, which we've always done with family photographs, but it's reached a different level now because there's not that evidence, you know, of struggle that there used to be in the outtakes, unless you're somebody like me and other people who love those and like, you know, seek them out and, and, and save them. Um, so I, I think about these things all the time. And just one thing I wanted to throw in, I once asked my niece, like, why, I said, you know, I, I said, why are you still on Facebook? I've been reading that, you know, when all of us old people got off, and young people got off, and she said, I can't get off because my whole history yeah. is there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's so brilliant of them. I mean, she has her photos, but she doesn't have all the tags. It's like deeper if you want to save your thing, what? Right. You, it's deeper than that almost, it's even more instrumental than that because yeah. you use Facebook to log into like 90% of things on the yeah. internet now. So even well, if you wanted to delete all yeah. of your content, you would still have to have Facebook I wrote the ones you I wanted to. Yeah. I've never <laughs> done that. That's like our purpose. But you're very <laughs> unlazy. I am. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, but just thinking of, I guess just thinking the photo way that yeah. it's her, so it's like that will like disappear, you know. If, um, like I'm still old fashioned, like if I take a picture of somebody, I'll email it to them. <laughs> and that's old fashioned, <laughs> you know, rather than put it up and tag them. You know, part thinking about privacy, but also thinking about <coughs> like how they'll, how they'll have it. And one last thing, did any of you read the, in the New York Times last week, someone did that um, an article about looking at archiving of family pho of photographs and looking at um, using iCloud versus Google Photos. And you know, Google Photos now will identify people, group people together. Um, I haven't used it yet. Yeah, um, that top one. Uh, no, I can't. Well, I know, it's not the, that. The no, it's best. That, no, it's the, that, that one. Yeah, it's that one. Uh, so what they, what they best basically said at the end is like Google is the best and you should just give up your privacy and just like give in to Google because you'll get a great system and they'll actually archive your photos in a way that's usable, wow. which, yeah, which is really uh, frighteningly true. You know, I spend hours doing that stuff, but that's me, it's part of my work. And, yeah. No, and I just want to pick up on that question, especially as we're moving towards the end of the hour, we can talk forever, but uh, there are at least a couple more questions that I want to make sure we touch on. And one is this lack of concern for privacy, which which uh, obviously we've kind of, uh, depending on which generation we belong to, you know, I certainly went through a period of sort of discomfort to kind of study comfort, and you know, I still don't have complete uh, yeah. Uh, disregard for that issue, but, but you know, largely it's been lost. And so, so then, if people are not concerned about their privacy yeah. so much, how does that, uh, how does that affect the political engagement of the local? If, if we're okay with that kind of pervasive monitoring, self-monitoring, other monitoring, we're just, it's just, you know, what does that change? And the other thing is, you know, I do want to touch on the topic of forgetting versus remembering. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we talk about that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you know, the potential implications of remembering everything. Um, but I, I think it's because of this obsessive photographing that you even said, just like this burst and doing <laughs> so much that we don't have that record we used to have. So I wonder if we are become less dependent on photos for, I think it's a question, for our memory. I think that's, that's one of the ironies of keeping yeah. so much and recording so much and documenting so much is that when you keep everything, you've kept nothing, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, no no Instagram can be important when, it, no matter how important it is, it just goes down extreme yeah. with every other one. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, there's, 
uh, I, I think that's one of the interesting things is uh, uh, Georges Bataille, this philosopher, he wrote about knowledge and non-knowledge. The more knowledge you create, you actually create more, more non-knowledge. You end up creating more secrecy. And more, yeah. um, Baudrillard uh, kind of came off of that as well. And I think uh, that I think the the case for the end of privacy is a little bit. Different. Yeah, <laughs> the uh, uh, the case for the end of privacy, I think, is a little mm -hmm. oversold. Uh, so much of what we are and what we do never makes it to the end. Uh, and in fact, posting so much uh, creates, uh, gives you room to not post things. When you see someone's stream of photos, no matter how intimate and granular yeah, yeah. they are, right. those photos beg what's between those yeah, yeah. stuff things. And I think a lot of people only look at the photos and they don't think about that gap between the photos, which is where the vast majority of your entire self in life is. Yeah, yeah. It's not all on the screen. I feel like that's almost buying a tech company's marketing a little bit too quickly mm -hmm. to think that you know this privacy is dead. It kind of plays into their marketing, but I think it's just absolutely false. Uh, most of what we do and you know, who we are is not documented yeah. on our sites. We couldn't do that. But I think there does exist concerns that because we upload so much database, that creates database which works toward training the machine learning algorithms that mm -hmm. detect our faces, our mm -hmm. locations, and we are contributing to yeah. the machine in some sense. So um, I think that's an interesting shift from uh, the question shifts from does the company own the data or does the company know something from the data that we don't know? Mm -hmm. And like if we are dependent on them to tell us you've met this person this many times, or you know, whatever. Um, and I think it's, photo is a very tricky one, but I think more about um, fitness data or like health data. Mm -hmm. If, if, mm -hmm. you know, if, if our search results are affected by the data that they hold, if we're searching for insurance, for example. Mm -hmm. um, if our, um, yeah, I mean, I was, there's, there's a lot more, how, I think the paradigm really shifted in the past five years, and I, I do think this the notion of artificial intelligence as uh, it's something to consider now. It's more than the algorithm. It's just more than the code. It's just this um, prosthetic knowledge, the model of the world that exists online and also in our heads. Um, can I shift the conversation a little bit on the memory and forgetting and sort of? A more positive thing because we're talking a lot about <laughs> no we're talking about the layers and I think it's really really important to talk about the layers and actually when I train faculty who are going to use digital media in their classrooms I force them to go through and read the terms of service because I think that's super important um, but at the same time there's more than um, convenience um, I suffer from aphasia occasionally like severe aphasia where I just can't remember the names of things like you've been amazing to me you can just like pop yeah. names off I have to go through so many layers of information to try to see if I can get a name and I honestly don't know if I would have been able to do my PhD had I not been able to use keywords to just figure out the author I was thinking about right. and it doesn't matter how I organize it my brain just at times cannot work that way it happens with my children it's really embarrassing I'm like, oh my gosh which name are you <laughs> and so I, I think that no it did it happened the other day in the car I went through all of the names before I got to my youngest son who I was trying to call it something my grandmother did so I'm pretty sure it's hereditary but there are these little things that sort of change what we're able to do and those are important so with the bad there's also good and if we didn't see good in it we probably wouldn't do it and it's not just that it feels good it's not just oh my gosh Google Google email is convenient it helps people work differently and collaborate in different ways and I think um, we sort of lose that and I don't know um, yeah we're sort of losing that and that's one of the things that I, I think we're forgetting yeah and this. I think one of the other important you know things that that's you know the good about this kind of uh, platforms uh, is that you know what you uh, write about um, and work on with that this you know um, that the archive used to kind of tell a different story of having this mm -hmm. um, possibility yeah. to tell non-dominant stories yeah. and mm -hmm. however much the, this information is dominated by these secret dark Google forces that, you know, there, there is this other side of it that allows more democratic uh, sharing of histories that are not dominant. Mm -hmm. and I think, 
I think my project was trying to say that there are all of these lives that were just normal lives that have been forgotten to a narrative of trauma and suffering. Mm -hmm. So there are no black women in history. There's only trauma and suffering from everything that's happened. But because things have been digitized, because the missionaries were on a mission to like also capture everybody that they were converting um, across the world, you suddenly have tens of thousands of pictures of people smiling, of people dancing, of people doing fun things, of people in their houses being happy, of people working. That sort of our counter narrative that was forgotten. Mm -hmm. But we get stuck in these narrative structures. Um, it's one of my issues with theory that don't that they cause us to forget that there are people in the middle of it who are just trying to make it from day to day, who are trying to find meaning in that little moment in between working in a field all day where they can stand next to their husband and smile. And we, we, we stop and pretend that there's more to, to life. And it's sort of a privilege for us to live in that space where we get to think that way all the time. If you talk to users, the first things they bring up are salary, support, care, yeah. pleasure, desire. Um, not that we're wrong to talk about exploitation and all that yeah. and all that thing, but it is amazing how, how much that gets left out. What you said also makes me think about that whole question of if we're living in a digital dark age, if this time will be forgotten because because archiving, personal archiving and archiving like most of the archives we're looking at are archives of the past rather than anything of the present. Mm -hmm. And what's gonna happen to all of our photos? You know, I just recently, my mother moved out of her house, so I had to go through all my letters to my friends from high school. Like, would my letter, wow. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like evidence, you know, of, of like these friendships I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> like, and the father smells, but the, but, you know, I just, I think about that, you know, a lot, as, um, uh, I mean, probably because it's what I've been making work about, but just, you know, you read about digital rot and everything that's happening, well, this age, except for what got printed in books, physical books, <laughs> um, you know, be remembered. And I think that's a great lead into our planned last question, which, mm -hmm. uh, which has to do with just, you know, you know, it's for all of you. Just how do you imagine actually future memory and and how you know with digital media and how pervasive it, it is and all of the things that we touched upon as it relates to it. You know, what, what is the future of memory, both personal and collective? Um, I can never answer that question, but I don't know how many people watch Star. You know where I start. So Star Trek Generations starts at the first movie with that you know I talk about with with um, Spock with um, yeah with um, uh, William Shatner and yeah Kirk Picard. Yeah, <laughs> Picard is it starts out where um, uh, Picard is in the holodeck having a fantasy and he gets called that it, he's told that his brother is killed. So this is. 2020, I forgot when Star Trek take like the 24th century, I can't remember. But what is the first thing he does is he goes back to his quarters and he pulls out an old fashioned snatch, uh, photo album and he looks through the pages. So that's how it starts and, and it ends with meanwhile the whole universe has been threatened with extinction. Uh, uh, um, Kirk and Picard save the day and the Enterprise gets destroyed and it ends with him looking through, the, everyone looking through the rooms of the Enterprise for his family photo album. So like Gene Roger could visualize everything changing except for that one thing. So I I I cannot think about the future because that's always what I think about. <laughs> and it's a great it's just great. And it's um so if you haven't seen that I don't know what the generation um links here and maybe we'll laugh with you now. <laughs> Forever it's crap. There's another algorithmically driven media form um just music. Um, and there's a video of a guy who was older and he has dementia and they play a song that he really liked when he was younger and for like five minutes after he's able to come back and speak with his family. Yeah. And I wonder if in the future our data streams and the algorithms will turn into sort of 
it'll turn into music for us. Mm -hmm. When we're older, we go through the streams, it bubbles up the things that we know will reach out to us, mm -hmm. and we'll be able to go back in different ways. Mm -hmm. I, think, I, I always think that's going to be surprising, and it's not something I would ever want to you know, burden myself mm -hmm. with today. I always think of like uh, Proust in, in Search of Lost Time. It's, uh, you know, not the things, I think the memories that really move you and pull you into the past are things that you consciously in the moment were like, this is going to be important, right? It's the Madeline cookie is the, uh, I, I remember I saw this photo recently of me and I'm like eight years old and I'm in my room and it's a foot, just a photograph of me uh, and me in the photo that just doesn't didn't move me a whole lot, but behind me was this shelf that I totally forgotten was in my room, and I curated my, my little tractors, and I and I did, and I had completely forgotten about that. But for a good year of my life, that shelf was really important to me, and seeing that I just came completely forgotten about the seeing that shelf. Suddenly, I was a kid again, and I remembered how important this this, this stupid shelf was for me, and that moved me like so deeply. Like I just remember like what the what it's like. Uh, mm -hmm. of being a kid again, and I think, you know, so it's a very, not exactly Proustian, but it, it shares in its same, uh, it's, it's this unexpected thing, and I think that's going to be what's interesting, is we have so much more material for that kind mm -hmm. of thing, like, I'm all, I've already used Gmail for 10 years, so I have, like, relationships that are 10 years old, romantic relationships, all that, like, happening in Gmail, and I'll just type a word in, like a, like a word I used too often, so like the fourth search result was like my girlfriend in 2007, and now there's an email chain right there that we had that was like right in the middle of, every, you know, it just doesn't make sense, but like those are the kinds of things that is like really random. I don't think we have any idea what that's gonna be like. We have no idea what 10 years, or 20 years, or 30 years from now when you have your entire life documented as much as we do. Like it's gonna be, it's gonna be fucked up and weird and fun and, and bad and I, I'm kind of looking forward to it. <laughs> There's also stuff you can't really delete unless you get really hardcore about it, and go into legal battles, but with that like, this kind of thing's bubbling back up and there's going to be more and more stuff. There's also things I don't want to see, like on LinkedIn I got a recommendation to add an ex of mine and it was like, I thought I deleted you from my <laughs> life. And it comes up though and then you start remembering things like that mm -hmm. or similar things on, on Facebook too. I find it interesting that they're doing these um, these memory posts now that kind of like, yeah, yeah they're awful. <laughs> I mean, to me, but. Do we um, unanimously agree that the Facebook memory posts are awful? I like them. They're interesting, but like, I, I said, why? Sometimes they're awful. If you, <laughs> I guess if you think too much about it, it becomes a kind of negative because you start thinking like, why did Facebook choose this one? Or like, what's going on? Do they want me to add these people back that I defriended back when people defriended people? Because now you just unfollow people, which is another issue. But. Um, from a perspective yeah. of a psychologist that would make our, our living from people having troubled relationship with their past. There's probably something on Facebook that our psychologists You know, like, oh, more and more things for you to think about your past. Now you can't even repress it because it comes up. Let's try it. But I think that ties into why I start going back and posting things in like in the 90s that are happening now because I want to see if Facebook will, if I can, not that I'm going to probably, but if I can trick the algorithm into starting to do something completely different, um, which I guess we'll see in the future. That memory hack. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Well, I think this right to be forgotten is yeah. very important. It's as important as our ability to remember through the prosthetics. And I think I am optimistic about technology in general. I do think, like, like many of us said, it does great um, enhancement of our ability to connect with other people, to remember over time. Uh, but there, the technology and technocracy is different. And the techno, the sort of the whole industry that is governed by the logic of technology and um, capitalism is is alarming. And I think the future is <laughs> this is a really dark future. But I, I do think we are going to the digital feudalism, where we don't own anything, where we borrow, and we we are subject to control because 
the, the means of production and also means of consumption, we don't own any of them. For example, the city bike is a good example. It's, it's incredibly convenient, but I don't own the bike. Right? Um, so if, if this is a kind of a new normal for our modes of being, it's, it's worth thinking about what does memory mean in that space. And I think this notion that when you call a call center, right, you have to give your information over and over again. It's this almost a Kafkaesque like space of no memory. It's like nobody remembers who you are, right? But it's actually really revealing that behind the slick interface, there are people operating these information. There are physical databases. There are uh, assistants in Mexico and India who respond to our call to Citibank, right? So we are participating. So uh, the, my point would be to balance optimism with realism and to not per um, to question the technocratic tendency to sit, call everything cloud computing as opposed to the distributed network of you know control structures mm -hmm. and this notion of like convenience over our agency. So I, I look forward to be forgotten at some day. It, it is going to be hard if you're a public person doing you know professional work. But I do think it, it is our right to be forgotten and remembered as a person, not through, you know, photographs.